fake news. <laughs> fake news? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fake news. You've all heard fake news, haven't you? Now, I don't know, was it Mr. Trump that invented this expression? Um, because he was saying that the media were putting out information about him casting aspersions on his character uh, and he called it fake news and it seems to have taken off now doesn't it this expression fake news but <clears throat> as I've been discovering uh, fake news is nothing new he's just given it a name um, as, as anyone ever and David will probably know this has anyone ever heard of Lord Haw Haw yes yes Lord Haw Haw was uh, an Englishman for those younger people <laughs> that was I was gonna say what word would you associate with him if you one word if you if traitor traitor yeah which is <laughs> so he was uh, he was an Englishman and he went over to Germany in the Second World War and whatever his beliefs or political beliefs I don't know but he decided he was going to work for the Germans and I don't know how often it was he would broadcast on the radio um, and because he had a, a very sort of English accent, he would broadcast out over the, the airwaves. So they would try and the Germans would send this radio broadcast of Lord Haw Haw over to England so that people could pick it up on their radios. And Lord Haw Haw would say, cast aspersions on Winston Churchill and the English government and, and sort of praise Hitler up and all these kind of things. So... Yeah, essentially it was fake news because he was deciding, uh, he, was, he was saying things about people that weren't true. So Lord Hall certainly was giving out fake news, wasn't he? <clears throat> the amplified losses, they, they, might lose, might, they might lose several, but we lost thousands. Mm. Yes, yeah, attitude. yes. <clears throat> um, and also, uh, in the war, nice little history lesson this morning, David probably knows more than I do. In the war, um, there was fake news that was used uh, in, a, in a different way. Um, there was a guy, um, and I, got, I don't know the names of the people, but they were the, basically the British intelligence um, took a, a, a guy's body, he'd already died, so it's all right, uh, and they dressed him in um, like a military, no, I can't remember what it was, but they dressed him a certain way and they put his body just off the coast of Italy um, and they left a, a note in his pocket um, which was describing uh, like secret information for where the invasion of Europe would occur um, in the hope that the Germans and the Italians would pick this body up and think they'd found a secret, which they did. And it did help a lot in the war off effort. It didn't completely convince them. But they thought this guy was, this body was true, but actually it was just a false identity they would given this person. Um, so that, essentially that was fake news as well. But they were trying to use it to uh, protect people. So fake news is all over the place, isn't it? And it's still happening at the moment and poor old Mr Trump <laughs> he's getting such a hard time isn't he and now Mr Johnson is having a hard time isn't he but it's happening all the time over the airways and the media but <clears throat> if we go into uh, John chapter 8 and we're just going to look at verse 44 if you want to turn in your books Nigel has kindly put that up on the screen for us Jesus is talking to the, the Pharisees, he's giving them a bit of a hard time because he's not happy with them, um, all their hypocritical statements and their condemnation of him, etc, etc, we know that. Uh, and this, he makes this statement in verse 44, it says, you Pharisees belong to your father, the devil. Ooh, bit nasty, wasn't it? And you want to carry out your father's desires, so the devil's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. How much truth is in the devil? None. None. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. He's got a language of lies. How bizarre is that? For he is his identity. He is a liar, and he's the father of lies. So the devil is the father of fake news. He did it before everyone else. He did it before Lord Haw Haw. 
He did it before all these people in the media. It's the devil, because it's his native language to speak lies and untruths. And we know that, don't we? We know that the devil is a liar. We know that lying is not a good thing to do. But as I was thinking about this and praying about it and things were going over in my mind, I came across um, this scripture. We'll go to this now. I think Romans chapter 1. Um, did I put that one? Yes, I did. <clears throat> so in Romans chapter 1, Paul is describing... Uh, the progression essentially of the human race from knowing God, which essentially would be right back to Adam and Eve, all the way through to the, the state that they were in at the time and describing why that happened. Some people often use Romans 1 as a bit of a, a whipping stick for people with different frailties or weaknesses and sins, but that's not Paul's, I don't think that was Paul's intention. He was trying to show us the progression, if, if you do these things or don't do these things, this is what happens, and this is what happens to society. So halfway through, he says, Romans 1, 21, he says, for although they knew God, so that just, just means generically, generally people, they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And those of you in house group, well, remember that we used to quote that verse week in, week out, until you were fed up with it? You remember? No. <laughs> Futile in their thinking, yeah. darkened in their hearts. When we don't give thanks to God, when we, we don't acknowledge him, when we don't recognise him, when we don't see him, our thinking becomes rubbish. We get stinking thinking, remember? We end up thinking the wrong things, we end up getting into fear and bondage, and what people call sin, you know, and all the bad things that are happening in the world. And Paul was saying, you know, this is where it starts. It starts back in the way we see God. So rather than looking at people's behaviours, he's looking at people's beliefs. Something we were learning over the weekend. Belief affects behaviour. And sometimes we try and be modify behaviour before we've changed belief. That makes sense. So anyway, this, this argument progresses, we're not going to read it all, but then in the next slide, we get to verse 25. And this is the verse that really kind of rocked me, because it says, so he's still talking about these people and the progression of the things that are going on, they're worshipping idols and doing all sorts of naughty things, and we recognise those things. And in verse 25 he says, They exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. 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 <laughs> um, but you notice there, I've put in capital letters in brackets, because the actual Greek, it doesn't say they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. It said they exchanged the truth about God for the lie. The definite article. And I started to think, well, what is the lie? Is there one lie that starts it all? Is there one lie that is worser than every other lie? Because we know the devil's telling lies, that's his language, isn't it? But what is the lie? What is the lie that mankind believed that caused it to fall into corruption, caused it to fall into all these behaviours that we know we don't like? What was the lie? And so I started to ask the Lord about this and think about this. And it goes back to something that we've been thinking about quite a bit and something we learnt over the weekend, I think, and I've been talking about a lot. You know, the Bible says, it tells us who God is. And the first lie, I believe, or the first, the lie, is the lie about the character of God. So when the devil appeared to Eve in the garden, he questioned God, didn't he? And we think about, oh, you know, he was questioning whether the, she should eat the apple or not eat the apple and do all these things. But essentially, the lie that he was propagating was God is not what you think he is. He was besmirching his character. He was bringing fake news to Eve because he was saying, did he really say that? Do you think that's what he really means? Does he really care about you? Is that what God is like? Maybe he's not like that. 
Maybe he likes to punish you. Maybe he's going to do this. Maybe he's coming after you. Or you can make your own decisions. You don't need him. Maybe he's not as clever as you think he is. And it's going after his character, isn't it? The character of God was assassinated by the devil. And Eve believed the lie. And we, as a society, as people, that's what Paul was saying, we've believed the lie. We've believed that the character of God is not what we thought it was. And that causes all sorts of problems because then we start to think of God as somebody who he's not. When we sin, we go and hide in the bush, even though God is looking for us, but we're hiding because we're fearful. Fear has come because we're fearful of God. And all these other things start to creep in when we, we try and run our own lives because we don't trust him anymore. We live out of our own resources because we think, well, he, he can't be that good. He can't be that caring that he would look after me. So I'm going to do this my way. That person needs my help. They, I need to tell them what to do. And we don't trust God, do we? We don't trust his character. I know in my life that's been true over the years and out of religion, organised religion, which I don't criticise anyone for, but a religious mindset causes us to think God in a certain way, think that he's going to punish us maybe, thinks that he doesn't love us, maybe he cares for other people more, maybe he gives them something a little bit more special than me. There's all these lies that assassinate the character of God. And it's really the lie. If we can see that as the lie, if we can get back to what God is like, we, we dissolve that lie, we bring it out with truth and we wash it away with the truth of who God is. And we have to find out who God is, don't we? The Bible tells us who God is, who we are, and how much he loves us. So it's important that we go back and understand the character of God because we need to refute the lie, the lie that came, the fake news, the assassination of the character of God. And that's why Jesus came. He did many things when he came, but one of the things he wanted to do was to show the character of God. And what better way than to be God? To stand amongst men, to love men, to embrace men, to take the, the dirty and unclean, the lepers, and say, this is what God is like. Not what you thought he was like. And the devil couldn't argue with Jesus. This is what God is like. So Jesus, when it's, it says Jesus is the truth, isn't he? So if the lie is the assassination of the character of God, then the truth is the revelation of the character of God, which is in Jesus. I'll say that again. <laughs> if the lie is the assassination of the character of God, then the truth, which is Jesus, is the revelation of the character of God. We see Jesus, we see God. Amen? Amen. That's so important however far we are along in our maturity as Christians, we can still be believing the lie. The lie can still come up from somewhere. I want to tell you a story of uh, a man called Herb Montgomery. I don't know, has anyone ever heard of him? He's a preacher. Um, I think he's a Seventh-day Adventist, so there you go. I cross all boundaries. <laughs> Um, but it's his testimony, really, and, and, and he's, it's amazing, it's a wonderful story, I'll tell you. Herb Montgomery, um, his earliest recollection of life now, some of us don't, I mean, how far back do you remember in your life? Does anyone remember when they were 10 years old? Yes. yes. Five years old? Yes. Yes. Two years old? No. You kind of don't remember much, do you, when you, you're that young? Well, her, his earliest memory, he said, was when he was four years old. And he was sitting in his high chair, he's an American guy, sitting in his high chair in the kitchen. And he remembers sitting there, and it was a significant moment in his life because of what happened. And, and his mum and his dad were talking, or as we call it, talking. But really they were arguing. arguing. They were having a fight, they were talking about, you know, 
shouting at each other. And he remembers this, and there was a bit of a to-do, they argued, and it was that day, that moment, that Herb's dad walked out and left. His father left, and he was left with his mum, and his mum brought him up as a single mum on her own. She worked really hard. She went out and got lots of jobs um, and had to strive to get money to keep them going, keep the rent. Um, and it was a difficult life for her because while she was working, she had to farm herb out to different people um, and she re they rarely saw each other. And he said, you know, that because of that, the, the times that they had together were very precious. And he, you know, he loved his mum and they, they cared about each other deeply. And as he was growing up, his mum said to him, what, he's, what she said was that your, your father has left us. Is that true? Or was that a lie? She, she told this little boy from the age of four, your father has left us. And he didn't see him for 10 years. He never saw his father, although his father only lived down the next block. He was, never saw him. The father never came round, never sent him a present. He had birthday after birthday where no card, no present, nothing, no money, nothing, not, not a signal, anything came from his father. And this went on for 10 years. And at the age of 14, Herb decided he was gonna, um, he felt convicted to see his father, to go and see his father, because he knew where he lived. Um, but he described, he didn't say it was like some big rush of emotion. It was like, oh, I, I better do this, you know, because he just wanted to know who this guy was. So he went to see his father, and his father was uh, pretty much uh, your old fashioned, stiff upper lip bloke, you know, no emotion. Um, and he went round and he said, at the age of 14, they, they sat down, you know, and, and said, hi, I've come round to see you. Uh, okay. And he, it didn't really spark, nothing really happened. He didn't feel anything for this bloke. Um, and, it, and he just locked up his emotions inside him. Uh, and this, he, he would see him occasionally go round and see him out of duty more than anything. But Herb Senior, because his name was Herb, didn't come and see him. It was just always him going to see him. And this, this went on for a few years. He, he occasionally saw him, but there was no connection, no chemistry, no reaction, no love for this guy who had not seen him, not done anything for him, not been there for him. Um, so I'll try and cut short the story, but it's, when Herb Jr. got to about 18, he met this girl and they fell in love. And, but she, she was a little bit savvy and she, she was uh, aware of the situation in his family, shall we say. And he was pleading with her to marry him. He wanted to get married. He loved her um, and she, he thought she was wonderful. Um, and she said to him, well, I'm not, I'm not going to marry you until you sort out your relationship with your dad, your father. And he was like, I don't know about that. <laughs> but because he loved her so much, because he wanted to marry her, you know, he kind of thought, well, I better keep trying to do something about this because he wasn't really interested in his dad, but he was interested in this girl. And he thought if he could please her. So he would still carry on going to see his dad. And then he took the girl with them. And then one day they were there and the three of them were sitting in the, the dad's living room. Um, and because the, her nature, she, she just come out with it. And in front of both of them, she looked at the dad, looked him in the eye and said, why didn't you go and see your son when he was a baby? Why didn't you go and look after, why didn't you do anything for him? Why didn't you give him any money? Can you explain that? And Herb Jr. was sitting there going, because <laughs> they'd never talked about it. And 
again, I can't describe this properly because you have to listen to his story, you know, it's with emotion that he said he started to see a, a tear appear in this old boy's eyes, you know, because he was a hard, you know, a man, <laughs> not showing any emotion, but something seemed to twinkle in his eye when she said that. And he said, apparently what happened was that he, he had left um, and he, he, he went, they went to court to try and settle the custody of young Herb. Um, but the, the mother was so vehement, um, and there's, there's a bit of a story around what happened, but in the end, the court would not give any custody to the father. It was all for the mother. But he had been told that he had to pay money, you know, maintenance. And then he got up from the chair and he said, come in here, and he took him into the living room and there was an old sideboard, he pulled this sideboard open and there was a big box and he pulled this big box out in front of his son and he said, have a look at that and he, and he opened the box up and inside the box were loads of um, letters and each one of them had return to sender, return to sender, return to sender, return to sender and all and later on, he looked, at all, looked through these letters and he discovered that every single month for 10, 20 years, however long it was, he had paid his, he'd sent the check to the mother, but she just returned it. And even sometimes he'd overpaid. So he'd, he'd always sent it, but it just came back. And then he showed him cards and presents, things that he'd sent to try and get them to his son, but they'd all come back. And by then, you know, young Herb was overwhelmed um, and there was tears and the old boy started to cry and the son started to cry and they realised. But it was what he wanted to share was at that moment, it was at that moment that young Herb loved his father. There was a new love in his heart, but he was exactly the same man, nothing had changed, but it was his revelation of his character. He suddenly realised who his father really was, and he'd never known that. Lies had covered that up, and he wasn't ever critical of his mum because there were issues, you know, she had a hard life, but it was untruth and lies about the character of his dad that stopped him loving him. But as soon as he knew who he was, as soon as he saw his real character, love sprung forth and we can't love God until we really know how much he loves us can we there's last night we were watching a film uh, about going back to the war uh, and it was a, it was about the um, people that make, made the information films during the war. There were lots of information films that come out in the cinema in between the pictures and the, the flicks, um, and they they would sort of be a bit propagandary, sort of like they would have a message in them, or they would tell you know like uh, get down into the air raid shelter quick if you hear the siren, it'd be reminding people of things like that. Um, but they were just short little films, and this it was about the. Um, department in the government that run, made these films and the, the scripts that they were writing. It's a good film. Um, but yeah, they, they were pumping out these little films to give people information and to tell them about things. And at the weekend, uh, Steve Campbell, who was doing the Bible study, he said, <coughs> and I'm connecting it with that a little bit, he didn't talk about the war and the films, but he said, you know, if, if you could take one thing that Jesus said you know, he said, look at me and you've seen me and you've seen the Father. But if you could take one thing, or if I was going to say, if Jesus could make one little cameo film that described the Father's character, if he was a modern day Jesus, you know, he thought, I'm going to put out a film in the cinema to describe what Father God is like, what would he do? A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And he divided his wealth between them. He didn't say, forget it. You're no son of mine. You, you come here wishing 
that I was dead, trying to take money off me. You're just pond life. Get out. He gave him the wealth. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be in need. And he went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into fields to feed swine. And he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that swine were eating. And no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and I will go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. And he got up and he came to his father. But while he was a long way off, the father got a rifle out and shot him. No. What did he do? Lifted up his skirt, his robe, and he ran. He ran and he kissed him on the neck. Did he remind him of all the things that he'd done wrong? Did he say, you know, we're going to have to put some rules down here, son. We're going to have to make a difference in your life before you come back into my house. No, he said, go and fatten the calf. Give him a ring, put sandals on his feet. He who is dead is alive, my son is home. The gospel is not about changing bad to good, it's about changing dead to life. And we've got to take that gospel out, haven't we? We've got to take that message out to people out there, wherever they are, whoever they are. They need to hear the character of God. They need to hear that, have that information message put out to them. They need to see the uh, information film of Jesus, the story of the loving Father. They need to understand the character of God and then if they know him and know that he loves, then they will love him, just like Herb. So it's encouragement really for us all to just get to know God, get to know him as a loving Father and then you'll find that love flowing out of you in your own identity. Amen.